I think this is one of those days when the power of American journalism deserves appreciation. Um, it's one of those days when the power of American journalism is like a, like a Klieg light in a dark sky. Look at what we have just learned. If you were able to follow each of these sort of paving stones as they were laid down one by one by great American journalists and then published by a free American press, if you were able to follow this one story all along from the beginning, today was a day when, righteously, you should just take a second and look back at where that path has led us to today and behold what good journalism can do and how valuable it is to us as a country. What we have just learned tonight in new reporting from the Washington Post and the New York Times is stunning enough in, in terms of its bottom line, but it's, it's, I think it's all the more stunning and it's all the more, you just have to have all the more civic appreciation for it when you see where it came from. Because where this started was in July, it was last July, 2016, during the Republican National Convention. They were doing something that usually the national press doesn't care all that much about. Uh, beat repo reporters cover it, political activists tend to cover it, but usually when at the convention they're doing the boring work of hammering out the various planks in the party platform that year, it's usually a very, very low profile thing. Covering that is not a glamour job. But every once in a while, reporting on something that is not a glamorous reporting gig, reporting on something that is that run of the mill, that predictable, that ordinary, that boring, dogged reporting on some unsexy topic like that can sometimes start to uncover the small edge of something that eventually crescendos into the biggest political scandal in a generation. In our case, the biggest political scandal in more than a generation. In July of last year, it started really boring. <laughs> Josh Rogan at the Washington Post was the first person in the national press to report out and write up the fact that the Trump campaign had let almost everything else slide during the fights over the party platform for 2016. But they did insist on one thing, and one thing only. And you can see it in Rogan's headline. Trump campaign guts GOP's anti-Russia stance on Ukraine. The Trump campaign had not given one whit about anything else in the Republican Party platform, but mysteriously, they showed up in force and without warning to insist that some anti-Russia language get weakened in part of the party platform that had to do with Ukraine. Now, that was really early on. It was last July, July 2016, and on the surface, it was an inconsequential story because who even knows what's in a party platform anyway, let alone abides by it. It's a very non-binding document. It's of arcane interest at most. But at the Washington Post, Josh Rogan found out that that weird thing had happened. He reported it out. He described what was known about how the Trump campaign had intervened to get that strange change. He interviewed subject matter experts from inside normal Republican politics who were bewildered by this change that the Trump folks had made. And on July 18th, the Post published his story. And it got picked up here and there. Uh, we did a little segment on it here on The Rachel Maddow Show. I remember that because my dad called after I got off the air that night and said, whoa, that little story was scary. What do you think that was all about? Hi, Dad. So that was mid-July last year. Again, Josh Rogan at The Washington Post. And he noted in explaining that strange thing that had happened with the party platform, he noted that Donald Trump's campaign chairman, Paul Manafort, had in fact worked as a lobbyist for the Russian-backed former president of Ukraine for more than a decade. It's just kind of stuck out there as this strange thing. Less than a month later, it was the New York Times, August 14th, a story bylined from Kiev in Ukraine. The lead reporter was a longtime Moscow correspondent for the Times. On August 14th, the Times published this scoop, which said that pro-Putin former dictator, who Paul Manafort had worked for, his political party in Ukraine had maintained what appeared to be secret ledgers of off-the-books payments that were never legally accounted for inside Ukrainian politics. And one of the people earmarked in those ledgers to get millions of apparently illicit dollars out of Ukraine, one of the people who turned up in that black ledger was Paul Manafort. The Times reported on August 14th last year that Manafort, the Trump campaign chairman, was apparently due to be paid $12.7 million dollars based on listings in this secret ledger. Four days later, four days after that report in the New York Times, it was Politico.com with a story from reporter Ken Vogel. 
a story that has aged remarkably well in the year since it was published and since Ken Vogel has moved over to the New York Times. But on August 18th, Vogel at Politico published what was basically a profile of, as you see in the headline there, Paul Manafort's man in Kiev. He profiled the guy who ran Paul Manafort's operations in Ukraine, who ended up brokering deals for Paul Manafort with Putin-linked Russian oligarchs like Oleg Deripaska. Oleg Deripaska is one of the richest men in Russia. He hasn't been able to get a visa to visit the U.S. because of our government's concerns about his alleged ties to organized crime. Deripaska is so close to Putin that uh, that, that that private matter of whether or not this one guy can get a visa to the United States, that matter is regularly brought up by Russian government officials as something that the Putin government would like addressed by the United States, please. Paul Manafort was doing deals with Oleg Deripaska along with his man in Kiev. Ken Vogel's profile last August of Paul Manafort's dealings with pro-Putin oligarchs like Deripaska, it explained that stuff in detail. It explained in detail Manafort's close working relationship with his main guy in, in Ukraine, this guy named Kalimnik, Konstantin Kalimnik. People called him Kostya, which is short for Kost Konstantin. Uh, Konstantin Kalimnik had, had worked closely with Paul Manafort for more than a decade. He'd done these deals with him, with the Russian oligarchs. He was known by lots of people in the region, including by lots of Americans who had worked on and off in Moscow. Konstantin Kalimnik was known as somebody who openly bragged about the fact that he was Russian military intelligence. He used to tell people that's how he learned such good English. He learned it at the GRU. From Ken Vogel's piece last August about him. This, this was my favorite line. He quotes uh, this guy who worked in Manafort, uh, sorry, worked in Moscow with Manafort's guy, saying, quote, it was like Kostya, the guy from the GRU. That's how we talked about him. So it's unsubtle, right? That guy, Kostya from the GRU, that guy, Konstantin from Russian military intelligence is Paul Manafort's man in Kiev. That's who he works with in Ukraine. That comes out August 18th. August 19th, Paul Manafort resigns from the Trump campaign the very next day. And a lot of things happened thereafter. Trump won the election, for one thing, and the intelligence community released its findings about Russian interference on his behalf in the election. And a lot of stuff happened, and it's easy to get caught up in the day-to-day -day accretion of additional damning and flabbergasting stories. But just focus on this one path. Just follow this one narrow path that started with that report from the RNC changing that plank in their platform. If you keep following that path, the next stone in that path got planted in March, March 8th, because Ken Vogel at Politico.com Politico was still reporting on Paul Manafort's man in Kiev. All those month, that, months after Manafort quit the campaign, Vogel stayed on that story about this, this Russian military intelligence guy who Manafort was involved with and who he'd done business with and business for all of those years, including all their business with Russia's uh, Putin-linked oligarchs. So on March 8th of this year, Ken Vogel is still on the story of that guy. And he reports, based on multiple sources, that Manafort was still dealing with this Russian military intelligence guy throughout his time on the Trump presidential campaign. This wasn't just something from Manafort's past. This lasted through the presidential election. And in fact, Kostya, from the GRU, uh, he, had, he had taken at least two trips to the United States to visit with Paul Manafort while Paul Manafort was working on the Trump campaign. Upon returning home from one of those trips to the United States, Kostya, the guy from the GRU, reportedly started bragging around Kiev that he had been the one who got that plank changed in the Republican Party platform. Quote, after a late summer trip to the United States, Kalimnik suggested that he had played a role in vetting a proposed amendment to the Republican Party platform that would have staked out a more adversarial stance toward Russia. Ah, so that's who did it. A Russian military intelligence guy is bragging about him writing part of the Republican Party platform in 2016. That's who did it. Or at least that's who's bragging about doing it. Then two weeks later, it was the Associated Press pounding another stone into this path. And the direction they took it suddenly made this seem all very serious. The Associated Press reported in late March 
that Paul Manafort and his Russian military intelligence sidekick, Kostya from the GRU, uh, they didn't just do business deals with Putin-linked oligarchs like Deripaska. The AP reports that Manafort signed a contract, an annual $10 million contract with Oleg Deripaska that committed Paul Manafort to work around the world to promote the interests of Vladimir Putin's government in Russia. According to the AP, that work to promote the Putin government internationally, it started in 2006. The contract said it was to pay $10 million annually. Incidentally, that reporting from the AP said that 2006 is when that contract started. It didn't say when it ended. So that was March from the Associated Press. That was uh, Jeff Horowitz and Chad Day who were the reporters on that piece. Then the following month, in June, it was the Washington Post again fleshing out that reporting that Paul Manafort had kept meeting during the campaign. He'd met at least twice during the campaign with his Russian military intelligence friend. And the Washington Post in June breaking the news that the special counsel, Robert Mueller, now investigating Trump-Russia connections, had issued subpoenas to, through a grand jury in, in Virginia demanding correspondence, communication, and contracts for work between Paul Manafort and... Kostya from the GRU, his Russian military intelligence colleague. All those paving stones pounded in to this path. And now today, having followed this path step by step, with all that good, subtle, dogged reporting over the past year plus, now we see where that path leads. Because today, the Washington Post breaks the news of where this ended up. Tom Hamburger, Rosalind Helderman, Carol Lennig, Adam Entis are on the byline today at the Post. The basis for their reporting appears to be what turned up in those subpoena documents from Paul Manafort about his relationship with the Russian military intelligence guy. Turns out you followed this investigation all the way down the path, and what is at the end of it? Well, here's the headline. Manafort offered to give Russian billionaire private briefings on the 2016 campaign. <sighs> Quote, less than two weeks before Donald Trump accepted the Republican presidential nomination, his campaign chairman offered to provide briefings on the race to a Russian billionaire, Oleg Deripaska. The Post noting correctly that this means even before Trump accepted the nomination to be the Republican candidate for president, his campaign was in direct communication with Russians closely linked to Vladimir Putin, offering them private, secret access to the Trump presidential campaign at the highest level. The Post reporting tonight also raising the prospect that that access may have been provided for money or in lieu of money. It's not exactly clear which. Um, according to the Post, amid what we now know were months of exchanges between Paul Manafort and Konstantin Kalimnik that took place during the campaign, they several times discussed, quote, money that Manafort believed he was owed by Eastern European clients. Quote, in one April exchange, days after Trump named Manafort as a campaign strategist, Manafort referred to his positive press and his growing reputation and asked, quote, how do we use it to get whole? Now, one way to interpret that is how do we use my newfound fame and political power in this presidential campaign to get me my money that those bastards owe me? <laughs> That said, since Oleg Deripaska has also brought legal action in American courts against Paul Manafort, claiming that Manafort owes him money, it's not inconceivable that what Paul Manafort meant there was, how can I use my newfound fame and my political power in this presidential campaign to pay off my debt that I owe to my Eastern European contacts? What could I do for them with this presidential campaign that might make them forgive my debt? This all started with what looked like a small ball report on a bizarre and out of the blue, non-materially consequential political oddity inside a back room at the Republican National Convention. It has ended as of today with news that the Trump campaign at the highest level was making contact with powerful Russian interests close to Vladimir Putin and offering them exclusive private access to the campaign in a way that implied that some sort of exchange might be expected for providing that access. Oh. The other big story, broken first by the New York Times and then by the Washington Post today, is the line item list of documents and information that the Robert Mueller special counsel inquiry has now demanded of the Trump White House. 
Now, we knew from the Times' reporting this weekend that the president's White House lawyer on Russia issues, Ty Cobb, uh, had received so many requests for documents and correspondence from Bob Mueller's office that he'd actually organized the requests into 13 different categories. I don't exactly know what the P-touch labels are on his 13 different files, exactly what he's called all his different categories. But tonight, the Washington Post has listed at least 11 different categories of information that Mueller has asked the White House about. Um, and it is, it's pretty stunning. I mean, this is the list we can extract from this new reporting. Um, actually, mostly this is just using the Washington Post language directly. According to the Post tonight, Robert Mueller, the special counsel, has asked for, number one, all internal communications and documents related to the FBI interview of Trump National Security Advisor Mike Flynn in January, which happened just days after the inauguration. Number two, Mueller has also asked for any White House documents that discuss Flynn's conversations with the Russian ambassador in December during the presidential transition. Number three, Mueller has asked for records about what happened when the acting attorney general, Sally Yates, came to the White House and met with White House counsel Don McGahn to warn him that Mike Flynn was not being honest about his communications with Russia. And in fact, Mike Flynn might be compromised by the government of Russia. Number four, Mueller has asked for anything related to Flynn subsequently getting fired by the White House, although I should mention, technically, Flynn was allowed to resign. Number five, and this is actually from the New York Times. New York Times also reports tonight that Bob Mueller has requested that all communications about the Trump foreign policy team, this, this controversial and non-conventional foreign policy team that Trump announced during the campaign, Mueller has asked for all communications about them as well. That's Carter Page, J.D. Gordon, Keith Kellogg, George Papadopoulos, Waleed Ferris, and Joseph Schmitz. You know, not all of those people are famous, but just off the top of my head, we've had reporting in recent months that George Papadopoulos was involved in trying to set up meetings with Russian government officials, including Vladimir Putin, for candidate Donald Trump. We know Carter Page was considered by the FBI to be potentially a knowing Russian agent. And those are just two of the names on the list, so you can see why the Mueller inquiry might be looking for communications related to them. Number six. Mueller inquiry is also looking for all documents related to meetings between President Trump and former FBI Director James Comey, while Comey still served at the FBI. Number seven, Mueller also wants records of any discussions in the White House about James Comey getting fired. Uh, number eight, this one is interesting. Uh, Robert Mueller has also reportedly asked for any White House documents related to the statement that was issued by the White House the night James Comey was fired. This is the Washington Post saying that Mueller wants documents about the statement that Sean Spicer made about the Comey firing on the night Comey was fired. But now the New York Times adds this, number nine. New York Times is reporting that Bob Mueller also wants documents on a different statement Sean Spicer made about the Comey firing that he made a week before Comey was fired um, on May 3rd. So Mueller looking for two, information on two different statements about the Comey firing made by Sean Spicer, a week apart. Uh, Sean Spicer, I will just interject here, is not yet known to have a personal lawyer on the Russia issue. Uh, this would imply that he should get one. Number 10, Bob Mueller has reportedly demanded any documents related to the meeting Trump held in the Oval Office with the Russian foreign minister and the Russian ambassador on the day after James Comey was fired. The New York Times helpfully notes tonight that that's the meeting where Trump told them firing James Comey, quote, relieved great pressure on him over Russia. Number 11, Bob Mueller has demanded, reportedly, all records related to the Trump Tower meeting, which involved Paul Manafort, Jared Kushner, the president's eldest son, and a whole clown car full of Putin-connected Russians. Number 12, Robert Mueller has also reportedly demanded all documents related to the White House's response in their effort to explain that Trump Tower meeting once it was first publicized in the New York Times. The White House and reportedly the president himself obviously shaped misleading statements about what happened in that meeting. Robert Mueller now reportedly wants to know how those statements came about. So... <laughs> it's quite a list. We had to go down a font size for what we're usually allowed to put on TV. Feel free to pinch and scroll. It's quite a list. This is what Mueller has reportedly demanded of the White House. 
So this is what we can surmise he's looking into. And it's, and it's interesting. All these different angles on what they're asking tell you what they're investigating in a way. They want to know how the White House responded to that dire Russia warning about Mike Flynn. They want to know about the lying about the Russia meeting at Trump Tower. They want to know about Trump complaining to the FBI director about the Russia investigation and then firing the FBI director and then saying after he fired him that, yeah, maybe it was related to the Russia investigation. Right, so all, all of these demands tell you what they're looking at, right? Tells you a lot about what the Mueller inquiry is looking for and what potential crimes they may be investigating in the White House. But so I think that's 11 points there. 12? No, that's 12. I will tell you there's one more which is my favorite one. You get all these, all this specific information, all these specific requests about all these other things they're looking for. But according to the Washington Post tonight, one other thing that they say Robert Mueller is asking for, <laughs> in their words, is, quote, any email or document the White House holds that relates to Paul Manafort. So all these other things are about an event or an action or an explanation for some White House behavior. But when it comes to Paul Manafort, they just want anything that has anything to do with Paul Manafort. Because thank you, American Press Corps. Since last July, at least, we have known with increasing specificity and, frankly, increasing alarm that Donald Trump didn't go out and find some normal Republican or even a radical Republican to run his presidential campaign last year. For some reason, the guy he picked is the guy working with the Russian military intelligence guy and the Putin-linked oligarchs to promote the Putin government and the unexplained debts and the black ledger payments and the pro-Putin political parties. We know now that investigators are all over him. We still don't know why Trump hired him. The only reason we know any of this at all, though, is because America has great reporters and a great free press. And today, of all days, if you do not subscribe to your local paper, you should fix that. I'm going, I'm going to play a commercial now. During the commercial, please get online, get your credit card, pay to get behind that paywall at your local paper. Seriously, your country needs you. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.